Jesus, see, maybe you cut this. <laughs> It was dead languages again <laughs> because I was at school uh, at, um, at our high, in our high school system in Italy. You start uh, learning Latin and ancient Greek uh, quite early when you are 14 and you study them for five years. And somehow, you know, studying these two languages in a parallel way and seeing that rules are very similar and still there are differences forces you to think how grammar works. It's not just your language, but it's many languages you're comparing. And that's, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's what started me. And that's how I got here and <laughs> in the end. So uh, the latest project dates now back to 2015 and it was uh, a thematic volume I edited together with two colleagues, Agnes Jäger and Doris Pinka, and it was uh, on language change. So not necessarily on dead languages because also languages that are well alive uh, change every day and uh, um, we wanted to investigate in particular the kind of change that happens, we, the title is language change at the syntax semantics interface. So uh, what happens in the meaning that makes the structure change or the question is is there also something happening in the structure that forces you to reanalyze the meaning uh, somehow and we had plenty of authors working with us for these uh, uh, thematic volumes from very different languages um, from uh, ancient Sanskrit uh, to Greek uh, uh, to some uh, um, Native American languages uh, so it was really exciting to hear how this all comes together how the questions that are race and the answers that are proposed uh, go in the same direction. Well, look, uh, for sure, uh, everything comes from, from society and from interaction somehow. Um, what, uh, of course, is challenging for us working on um, very ancient languages is to reconstruct this scenario because we see this happening every day and um, we actually are very interested in research on second language acquisition, on contact migration because this is the kind of setting that is uh, really uh, crucial for those changes to happen. But what was happening in uh, ancient Greece, what was happening in the Roman Empire, that's really difficult to reconstruct. There's fascinating attempts to do that, uh, but um, in the end we have to base ourselves on uh, texts, and many of them are literary texts that uh, give you another insight. So maybe they tell you little about how uh, real language change proceeded in society, but they show you very well uh, another aspect, which is uh, the pressure of communication. So people want to catch other people people's attention, right? When you speak, you want someone to, to, to listen to you and, and to catch what you're saying. And so there are many signals that people are giving uh, um, uh, to do that. Like if you negate something, uh, you, uh, you might say, I don't want this, but you can also say, I absolutely don't want this. And you're catching more attention this way. And this is what makes the grammar of negation uh, change towards a new system. So also this pressure to uh, catch attention is something very important for language change. So I really think linguistics is very important. I should find a very clear place uh, at school, for instance, at this conference there is a special panel about that, grammar and linguistics in schools. Uh, of course, I cannot deny that most of the time we spend doing formulas, trees, uh, reconstruction is not something that has a direct impact on society. But exactly those questions we were discussing about uh, language change and the dynamics of communication are really something that uh, can be uh, useful if transmitted in a proper way for people to understand, for instance, how important it is to have many languages in their own life and in society and to find a way to cope with uh, multilingualism in a way that is productive for, for everyone. So, for instance, many of us, even people who used to work on uh, more theoretical aspects, are now really driven to research on migration, uh, second language acquisition, uh, just because we, we recognize the, the more abstract problems we are dealing with in what is happening now in society and we think that linguistics is really a way to show that uh, being mixed uh, can be nice, can be interesting uh, and can really also favor uh, you know interpersonal communication because you have to relativize everything. Uh, you're not uh, just thinking in your language, you have to take into account that there are many other languages. So I think this is really the most important uh, impact linguistics can have. I think uh, doing, especially doing historical linguistics shows you that there was never a state of uh, purity or of uh, individuality. So languages are born uh, uh, creole somehow, are born uh, through a mixture. They keep 
mixing, uh, despite the fact that, for instance, today we can reconstruct a wonderful genealogical tree for languages. So we know where they come from, for, for many of them, not for all of them. And, uh, and the linguistic evidence uh, meshes well with the genetic evidence. So, of course, people have their own languages, but they kept sharing languages and uh, uh, changing them according to their, to their um, environment all the time. So, really, linguistics is one of those sciences that will tell you there was no previous stage where we were alone and uh, isolated and everything was beautiful. It's always been uh, that mixed. What it is a rule today used to be an exception uh, uh, yesterday. So, uh, language change often goes unnoticed because many little structural changes are really things speakers don't don't notice uh, but you were uh, talking about words so the lexicon uh, our our treasure of words is something that is really visible and that uh, people have control on and in this case there is a, there's always been a lot of uh, pressure to keep things as they were and to have a proper way of, uh, of uh, talking and of course it's uh, standardization processes are very important there has to be a norm because um, this is what happens anyway and so it is good to have it to have a code to, to, to teach to other people, for instance. Uh, but at the same time, um, if you see it historically, you will see that what you are defending today used to be a horrible thing so for grammarians of 200 years ago. So it's flux. It's all in flux. <laughs> well, I think uh, given my love for dead languages, I have to answer uh, yes, and that's Latin, for sure. Okay. What's, uh, tell me why. What do you like about Latin so much? Well, of course, for an Italian-speaking person, for a Romance-speaking person, it's uh, the root, so uh, it's, it's very different, of course, but uh, still, it is very interesting for me to, to find back in Latin uh, parts of what uh, I use today to, to express myself. And also, I have to say, I love the literature, that's what brought me to, to, to the language, not the other way around, so, yeah, <laughs> and it's a cool language.